Good afternoon. We'd like to welcome you to today's program, Reclaim Your Calendar, Productivity and Time Management Tactics for Lawyers, Part 2. Sponsored by the Women in Law Section, the Committee on Law Practice Management, and the Committee on Continuing Legal Education of the New York State Bar Association. We would like to make a quick reminder that renewal season is still underway for 2023. And to renew your NISBA and Section dues, please visit the link shown on the current slide. If you have already renewed, we thank you for your continued membership and support. Today's program will run from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. And during the course of today's program, if you would like to pose a question to today's speaker, please feel free to use the Q&A tab in the Zoom portal. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn it over to the chair of the annual meeting and programming committee of the Women in Law section, Laura Sulem, for some opening remarks. Laura? Thanks so much, Ernesto. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Sulem. I chair the Women in Law section's programming committee, and I'm a senior director at Practical Law, which is a Thomson Reuters company. Thank you so much for joining the Women in Law section's program today on Reclaim Your Calendar, Productivity and Time Management Tactics for Lawyers, Part 2. Before we get started, I'd like to say just a few words about the Women in Law section. Our section has over 800 members and is really dedicated to addressing critical issues impacting women attorneys and women in general. We are always looking to increase our membership and to welcome women and men attorneys to our section. Please reach out to us if you would like to join. As a member, you can participate as much or as little as you like. If you are interested in further developing leadership and speaking skills, you can join one of our many committees, such as the Annual Meeting and Programming Committee, which helps organize CLE and non-CLE events like this one, as well as our annual meeting each January and the Women on the Move program each fall. We also have a Champions Men Advancing Women Committee, and that committee engages men as partners to help advance women in the profession and in the association and in society. Our General Counsel's Committee develops strategies and tactics to help advance women lawyers within companies and also as outside counsel. And we have a legislative committee which drafts memos in support of or in opposition to proposed New York State legislation that affects women. In addition to these committees, we have many other committees, uh, 17 in total, and we welcome your ideas and help in planning events and other activities. We also have a newsletter called Wills Connect, and we are always looking for contributed articles. So please reach out to us if you would like to write one for an upcoming issue. Our newest issue is coming out soon. You can stay up to date with our section events by following our page on the NISBA website. I'd like to take just a minute to highlight two upcoming events and welcome you to join either or both of them. On April 4th, you can join us for a program on what's next, Alternative Careers for Lawyers. And on April 27th, we have a book club meeting for the memoir, Getting to Ellen, a memoir about love, honesty, and gender change. The author, Ellen Krug, is attending the meeting. So with that, we will get started on today's great program led by Alyssa Mallon. Alyssa is an attorney and professional development and wellness coach to lawyers. Inspired by her own experience as an attorney whose life was transformed by coaching, Alyssa became a certified coach, left her job as general counsel to a New York City real estate investment firm, and founded the Stett Collective to help other attorneys achieve the same kind of transformation. You can find Alyssa's full bio in the program materials. Alyssa, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Laura. And thank you to the Women in Law section. I really appreciate your collaboration with me in, in being a part of this program. And also a big thank you to the NISBA Committee on Continuing Legal Education and the Committee on Law Practice Management, um, who are, as Laura said, are the co-sponsors of this two-part webinar. So thank you so much. Oh, you know what? I'm, let me share my screen here so we can. There we go. All right. 
Okay, so um, I want to also extend a big thank you to everyone that's here. Thank you to those who are returning from um, part one. I hope that you got a lot out of part one and um, that you'll get even more out of this part two. Um, I also want to thank those who are here for the first time. And just so you know, you don't you don't have to have attended part one to understand what we're talking about today in part two. However, I strongly recommend that you go back and have a look at um, at part two because or sorry, at part one, because um, it'll give you even more context for what we're talking about today. But it's not at all necessary to understand what we're talking about today. Um, so Laura gave you my background. I am an attorney still licensed in the state of New York, um, and I'm a professional development and wellness coach to lawyers. Um, my my coaching practice, um, the way that I like to, I, I call myself professional development and wellness coach because um, that's a little less scary to lawyers. Sometimes the word life coach is a little bit of a, a turnoff for, for clients and some, especially lawyers where, um, you know, life coach might sound a little woo woo, but life coach is really the best way to describe what I do. And the reason is that when coaching lawyers, there are so many aspects of our professional life that spill over into our personal lives. And so, when I'm working with lawyers, I'm often helping them figure out ways to get more out of their life out, outside the office or to find a better a better distribution of time between the two. Um, I work with I I focus I work with all attorneys, but I do focus on working with female attorneys for um, a number of reasons. Uh, the the primary reason is that. From my experience and the experience that I've I've had with uh, the clients that I work with, the female clients I work with, there there are a lot of influences. Coaching is about action. Um, coaching is about creating new results in your life, and so in that respect, there's a lot of you know autonomy in in the way that you're creating your results. But um, in the context of women in law. There are also other influences. There are there's socialization. There are ways that women are socialized um, that influence the way that they show up in the workplace. And there's the way that our society treats women that also carries over into the workplace. And so um, I wanted to be able to help women who had similar experiences as me in the workplace to kind of understand what's going on, understand those influences, and then find ways to overcome them. So um, my background, I had, I've had 20 years of experience in all legal settings. I've worked in government. I've worked in private practice. I worked in-house as a general counsel. Um, I worked in, in a court for a judge. Um, and so I've really experienced all of the settings that you um, that are attending this, this webinar have experienced. Um, I think most of our attendees today are in the practice of law, but we do have some people in government, some in-house attorneys, some people in the nonprofit world. Um, all of this will be relevant to you. I'll primarily be speaking um, in the context of law practice, since that's the majority majority of our attendees, but it's all translatable to any setting in the legal field. Um, many people are surprised to hear that I left my role as general counsel. I know for a lot of practicing attorneys, it's kind of like the end point, you know, you want to go go in house and get to that general counsel role and um, and and kind of hang out there for the rest of your career. And I, I felt that way in many ways. Uh, not to say that that's the only end point, but it was one for me. I, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and once I got there, I didn't feel the satisfaction that I thought I would feel. And the reason was because I was still feeling all of the stress all of the anxiety, all of the overwhelm um, that I had felt really throughout my whole career. I came into law practice um, and, you know, those, those, those feelings actually first set in well before law school. Um, they were heightened during law school. And then um, 
I went into law practice and in law practice, I really um, thought that, you know, it was just the learning curve. And as, as I became a better lawyer, I would feel less stressed out, um, less anxious, less overwhelmed. I would learn how to manage my time better. I would feel more confident uh, in what I was doing. And while I did get better, the feelings around all of that didn't change that much. And so I found myself in um, my ninth year uh, in-house with this real estate firm and I real estate uh, investment firm. And I, I got to the point where I was like, I really can't live like this anymore. I need to do something. I had gone to therapy for years um, and therapy, I'm a huge proponent of therapy. I think that it it's incredibly helpful for figuring out, understanding the underlying factors that are contributing to how you feel. Um, but for me, therapy didn't give me the tools to kind of address how I was feeling in my day-to-day -day life. So uh, that's where coaching came into me. I found a coach that really showed me how to concrete steps on how to address these issues. Um, and they were so transformative to me that I became a coach and um, several years ago left my my role at the real estate investment firm and became a full-time coach to lawyers. Um, I do just quickly want to touch on what we talked about last, let's see here, make sure we're on the same page here. Okay. Um, I want to quickly touch on what we did uh, during the last, um, sorry, I'm just getting my bearings here with a little technology snap. Here. What we talked about last uh, last time with the first part of this webinar. So we talked about procrastination. Procrastination took up the majority of our time during that um, that program. We talked about perfectionism, how lawyers are prone to perfectionism. We talked about um, uh, really perfectionism, how perfectionism, perfectionism contributes to procrastination and overwhelm. We'll be talking about overwhelm today. Um, and one, one thing I wanted to mention is we did a poll during the last during the last um, part one, and we, I meant to bring up the poll, um, polling the audience before we talked about procrastination. So um, we're not necessarily seeing the results. The, the poll that we ended up doing was after I had talked about, about procrastination. And so there, the results are a little skewed, but let me tell you about the poll. So the poll, 51 people, people participated um, the questions were, do you procrastinate? The second question was, do you, do you think procrastination is necessary or helpful? And then the third question is, do you think you work better under a deadline? Um, so, so what we came back with in the poll was really interesting. So of the 51 people that participated, 49 said, yes, I procrastinate. Of, of those 51, six said yes to, do you think procrastination is helpful or necessary? So very few people think that procrastination is helpful, um, which of course I would agree with. Um, and then to the third question, do you think you work better under a deadline or under pressure? Interestingly, 26, 26 people said yes. And that was after I had already taught a whole lesson on how you, it's a myth that you work uh, better under a deadline. So still 26 people thought that they work better under a deadline. So you can see kind of the disconnect of procrastination is not good for you, but it creates a situation where you're under pressure and then you convince yourself that you work better under a deadline. Um, so I just wanted to highlight those poll results from the last time in case anyone was curious. Um, and again, I encourage you to go back and uh, watch the taped version of part one to learn more about uh, procrastination. One more housekeeping question. Um, we did have one person from the part one uh, pose a question that I just wanted to read. I think it's a really important topic. Um, this person asked, 
But what about when the cause of the procrastination isn't our thoughts, but it's actually a chemical imbalance in the brain, i.e. ADHD, um, people with ADHD have a deficiency of dopamine or an insufficient dopamine distribution system. Dopamine gets us from knowing how to do something to actually getting down to doing it. And that's very true. I'll talk a little bit about dopamine today. Um, so the, the procrastination isn't the problem and can't be overcome with thoughts, but rather with, but rather is a symptom for ADHDers and needs, and needs a balancing of the nervous system chemistry in the body. There are multiple paths for this. Um, what solutions do you suggest or offer for those of us fully diagnosed with this neurodivergence to get around the procrastination as a coping mechanism? Um, and so I'm still learning about ADD and ADHD and other, other neurodivergencies. Um, it's, I recognize that it's, um, you know, a very common um, condition among among people, especially people in law, we we encounter it a lot. Some of those some of those neuro neurodivergencies lead to um, being very skilled lawyers. So um, I don't want to pretend to be an expert in this area by giving advice, but I will recommend a coach who is excellent in this area. Her name is Sean Roney, and that's S H A U N. Roni is R-O-N-E-Y, um, and you can find her at revealedpath.com. That's R-E-V-E-A-L-E-D-P-A-T-H.com. Um, so for those of you who are curious and exploring that further, I would encourage you to reach out to Sean Roni. Okay. Um, our agenda for today, we are going to be talking about um, anxiety, how to immediately reduce your anxiety, overcoming overwhelm, how to set priorities, organization and productivity tips, and then finally the work-life balance myth. Okay, so to, to understand what I'm going to be teaching today, I, I just want to quickly refresh you on my coaching philosophy, because I, um, and I, I apologize to those who were on the last uh, webinar, but it's very important to understanding what I'm teaching. Um, most people seek coaching because they want to change something in their lives, like I said. Perhaps they want to change what they're doing, um, or it's just stop doing something, do, or start doing something new. Um, and most coaches are trained to focus on helping their clients change their actions to get a, de a desired result. Um, and they do this through accountability coaching, habit tracking, et cetera. So most coaches you'll find are action-based. So they're going to tell you what you need to do to create these new results. So you're going to come up with a plan. Um, my focus, uh, rather than being action-focused, my focus uh, in my coaching is based on the teachings of cognitive psychology and neuroscience. So those of you who have who are familiar with neuroplasticity or um, who you know have seen have seen a cognitive behavioral therapist, some of this may sound familiar to you. Um, so this is to say that uh, my philosophy is based on the premise that long-term change cannot occur in our lives without some adjustment in our belief about how about ourselves and the world around us. Um, so there's no question that your actions create the results that you see in your life. If you start doing something different, you're going to get a different result. But what drives our actions, our belief system? We act based on what we think and believe and based on the emotions inspired by our thoughts and beliefs. So to get lasting results in your life, you have to make adjustments to the way you are thinking and therefore the way you are feeling. Returning to our gym, or sorry, not, not returning to our gym analogy. I made a gym analogy in the last um, program, but I really don't have time to cover it in this one. Um, but changing the way you think will lead to a change in the way you feel, and a change in the way you feel will cause you to act differently. Um, and this is the coaching framework I use with my clients 
um, who are lawyers, to reduce stress and burnout, improve time management, balance their workload, and just create a more sustainable life both inside and outside the office. And um, some of the topics I work on, my work with on, uh, work on with my clients are, uh, like I said, burnout, time management, people pleasing, perfectionism, self confidence, imposter syndrome, um, and then you know there's the, some of the more practical things: how to for a raise, how to prepare for mentally for your review, um, job transitions you know, the, the decision-making process in changing jobs or careers or how you decide whether you want to stay where you are. Um, so that just gives you a sense of what I what I do with my clients. Um, and lastly, I just want to quickly address again that my focus is uh, working with female attorneys. That's why this one of the co-sponsors of this program is the Women in Law section. Um, and as as I believe Laura mentioned, my coaching practice provides an online coaching community for women in law. Um, again, most of the most of the issues I work on with my clients are human issues. Most humans experience them, um, but people who become lawyers tend to experience them or have to have traits that make them more prone to certain struggles, including time management, um, which we're discussing today. And again, I focus on female lawyers because due to social conditioning um, and the realities of professional women's lives, some of the struggles lawyers experience are uh, experienced by women at a heightened level, either more frequently or more intensely. Okay, now you may have signed up for this webinar thinking that I'm gonna just hand you the key to time management. And I am handing you the key to time management, but I'm not doing it in handing over a perfect organizational system that's going to work for you and create a stress-free life as a lawyer. Um, the truth is, is that there's no organizational system that's perfect. Um, and there's just the system that is perfect for you. So, you know, you, you may have had the experience where you where you see uh, the system that one of your colleagues use. Um, and this person never, you they are never working late. They never seem to be working on weekends. They always get their billing done on time. They're always handing in their assignments on time. And so you say to yourself, oh, that's what I need to do. So um, you try that system, but you, but, the second that it doesn't work or you put things on your calendar and you don't seem to do them, um, you, assume, you assume that, oh, that person must just innately be better at time management and I'm just bad at time management. When the reality is, is that the system didn't work for you because you didn't have the mindset to make the system a success. Um, so no organizational system, no matter how good it seems, will work for you without the proper mindset to actually implement and follow through with that system. Um, and when I say mindset, I'm again referring to the thoughts and feelings that drive our actions. Um, the way we think is driving our actions and creating our results. Okay. So what's the relationship between anxiety and productivity? Most of you probably already recognize that they're very closely linked. Um, anxiety is the number one pro productivity killer. It is also the most common issue that my clients come to me for help with. Um, anxiety, so many lawyers, you know, clients and just colleagues tell me that they just feel a constant kind of um, low-grade anxiety all the time. And then there are, you know, spikes in that anxiety when certain projects um, are on their plate. Um, and so overall, they just want to learn how to address that anxiety. Um, so how does anxiety affect productivity? Well, there are two primary ways. Uh, the first is when you're anxious, you tend to avoid your work. And we talked about that a lot last time with um, procrastination. Um, you tend, when, when you're feeling anxious, you tend to uh, feel overwhelmed 
you procrastinate, you buffer, and buffering is doing other things to avoid the work. So a lot of lawyers buffer with work. So instead of doing the project at hand, you open your email and you start answering emails that you don't necessarily need to be answering or that you hadn't planned to be answering during that time. Um, and this is to take your mind off of the tasks that you were meant to be doing. Um, the second way that anxiety affects productivity is um, that the anxious brain is not a clear thinking brain. Paranoid thoughts start to seem rational to us when we have tr and we have trouble differentiating between reasonable arguments and unreasonable arguments um, when our brain is anxious. So to be more productive, we have to reduce our anxiety levels. But how do you do that? Um, it's a layered approach. And um, I'm going to teach it to you right now. So um, to immediately address your anxiety level, you so many of you may um, may relate to, to this feeling of anxiety. Um, and to, to address it, you first have to deal with the feeling itself. Uh, we deal with the feeling first by often, um, by the time we become aware of the fact that we're anxious, we are already experiencing the physical sensations that come along with anxiety. So you're already in the throes of, of, the, of the feeling. Um, so you're having a racing heart, tightness in the chest, you can hear your blood pounding uh, in your ears, dif difficulty breathing, and you can have any one of these or all of these um, sensations, clammy hands, uh, feeling of nausea in your stomach. Maybe you twitch your foot or twitch your hand. Um, there, it shows up in a number of different ways. Um, this, uh, this, the, the physical sensations that you're experiencing when you're anxious are caused by the release of cortisone and adrenaline into your body as part of the stress response. And um, we got we got into kind of the brain science behind the stress response in part one. So go go check that out. But in short, there's your brain has two parts: the primitive brain, which is responsible for the fright or flight response. Um, which that part of your, and then you have the prefrontal cortex, which is the rational brain, the brain that makes decisions, the brain that plans, um, the brain that thinks about the future. Um, so the primitive brain is, is responsible for our stress response, and it hasn't evolved enough to differentiate between a lion that was going to eat us in prehistoric days and an email from a, an upset client. So we could have the same physical reactions to that email as we might have if we saw a line outside our cave. Um, so we, we use the rational brain to calm our brain and, and tell your body that you're safe. And so to do this, um, I, I like to do what I call a body scan. Um, and you may have heard of a body scan in um, meditation. It's often used, this is a little different than what is done in meditation. Um, this is a check in with your body for physical sensation. So the first part, the first thing you're going to do is kind of check in with your body. And then you're going to describe, this may sound a little silly, but you're going to describe the physical sensation, the physical sensations that you're having in your body as if you were ex describing them to an alien who does not understand human emotion. So, they don't understand the word anxiety, but they do understand physical sensation. So when you tell them, when you explain to them how anxiety feels, you're going to describe your physical symptoms. Um, doing this actually helps you distract your brain from the problematic thought, which is currently running on a loop in your head and causing you to be anxious and um, catastrophize as we lawyers are trained to do, always thinking of the worst case scenario, the worst case outcome for our clients. Um, and in this case, it's working against us. So this is giving your brain a different path than thinking the thought that's causing the anxiety. Um, this reassures your brain that you are safe. Um, and if you're, if you're able to take the time to describe the sensations, it makes it clear to your brain that the stakes are lower here. 
So the stakes of an email are much lower than the stakes of being eaten by a lion. Um, you are not in physical danger. You are just feeling an uncomfortable physical sensation. And that's really all anxiety is. Our primitive brain is telling us we're going to get eaten, but really you're just feeling a physical sensation that's uncomfortable. Um, and this will take the edge off and take down the urgency of the anxious feeling. Um, now, I just want to point out that when you are describing how you are feeling, it's important not to use the word for the emotion. So here it would be anxious. Saying I'm anxious is not going to help you because that word is a very loaded word. Um, so again, describe the emotion as a series of physical sensations in your body. This short circuits the emotional reaction to the word itself. Um, it's also another uh, warning here. It's very easy to think you don't have time to do this exercise because when we're feeling anxious, all we wanna do is just hurry up and solve the issue and um, get yourself out of that anxious state and you think by you know quickly doing something to solve the problem that that will relieve the anxiety but um when you're acting from an anxious place this makes you much less effective um and then you end up spending more time in the end because perhaps you've made mistakes or perhaps you have to redo the work or elaborate on the work so if you can invest five minutes in doing this exercise you will end up saving yourself time so again it's Describe, this is level one, describe the physical sensations in your body um, as if you were describing them to someone who doesn't understand human emotion. Okay. Level two, um, and for those of you who participated in part one, this will sound familiar. Level two is um, addressing the thought that is causing the feeling. So again, our thoughts create our feelings and our feelings create our actions and our actions create our results. So um, we've been taught that it's external circumstances that cause how we feel. So whenever there is an external trigger, for example, the email from an, an uh, unhappy client, um, there's always a thought that happens immediately after that trigger. And that thought is what's causing you to feel anxiety. So here's, here's proof. Some people have trouble kind of wrapping their mind around this concept. Um, so, and, and, and wrapping their mind around the idea that the email is not making them anxious. The existence of an email from an angry client alone is not making you anxious because let's take, for example, a situation where the client sent the email, but you haven't looked, you're in court for the day and you haven't looked at your email uh, for a few hours. Well, the email exists, but it hasn't affected you because you don't know about it. So the email cannot be causing your feeling. It's when you become aware of the email and then you have a thought about the email that creates the anxious feeling, you know, the feeling of, oh no, this client's unhappy with me, or, oh no, I made a mistake. Um, Another example is a situation where, you know, there's a motion that has to be argued for a particular case. And one person might, who is less experienced, may think, um, I don't know how to do this, or I'm not going to succeed, and um, or the judge is going to think I'm stupid, or, you know, any variety of, um, of kind of negative thoughts about the motion. Um, well, while a completely separate person who may have to argue the same motion, um, but who's more experienced might be excited or confident um, in, in that motion. And that's because they're thinking different thoughts than you. So the fact that the motion, the arguing of the emotion exists is not what's causing your feeling. It's your thought about the motion. Um, so noticing the thoughts you're having that are creating the anxiety allows you to get distance from them. I recommend writing down these thoughts to see that they're just thoughts. They're just words on a page. They're just sentences running through your mind. They are not fact. It's not a fact that you're not good at, at motions. It's not a fact that you don't know how to argue emotion. Um, and once you recognize that it's just a thought and not a fact, 
and that you have the ability to change your thoughts, your lawyer brain can then go to work at understanding why you don't have to believe those thoughts and what um, and and you can start thinking about what you'd like to think instead, which would be a less anxiety inducing thought. So this work, this thought, I call it thought work. It's a really awesome um, tool and it's a tool that lawyers are particularly cut out for because as lawyers, we're always trained to be thinking of al alternative explanations, other ways to look at a problem, um, uh, other ways to interpret the facts. So um, lawyers tend to be very good at, at this thought work and, and coming up with a different thought. And again, the thought that you are coming up with has to be a believable thought. Um, it doesn't have to be the opposite of of what your original thought is. It just needs to be something that's believable, that feels a little better. And that will help you bring down your level of anxiety. Okay. So now we're gonna take this skill set that we've just gone over and we're going to tackle overwhelm with, with these skills. Now, um, just a moment here. Okay, so what causes overwhelm? So there's what we think causes, causes overwhelm. And we think that it's our workload. It's an unreal, unrealistic supervisor or client or partner. Um, it's family responsibilities unexpected things that come up. It's your desire to have a social life and have, be physically healthy. It's kind of that having it all mentality um, and or the pressure to have it all that that we think causes overwhelm. And these are kind of the external factors I was talking about before that we're, we're trained to think that these outside factors are what's making us feel the way we feel, that are making us feel overwhelmed. And Overwhelm is very tightly related to anxiety. Um, anxiety. Overwhelm is kind of a borderline thought, thought and feeling where you can feel overwhelmed, but you can also think that you're overwhelmed. And I would say that when you are overwhelmed, you're also experiencing a level of anxiety. Um, so you may be thinking, I have too much work to do. Um, but again, like I said, these external factors are not what are what's causing your feeling of overwhelm, your feeling of anxiety. What's causing them is your thoughts. Um, so, so the thought, um, I don't have enough time. The thought, I have too much to do. Um, there's no way I'll ever be able to get all of this done. These are all the thoughts that are then leading to that feeling of overwhelm, leading to that anxious feeling um, that kind of makes you want to shut down. So um, our thoughts cause our overwhelm. And um, it's not really, you know, you think, like I said before, you, you, you see other people that don't be, seem to be experiencing the same level of overwhelm that you feel, and they seem to be similarly situated as you. It's not that those people are innately gifted in time management. They just are having different thoughts. Um, so when we have this feeling of overwhelm that's caused by how we're thinking, we kind of go into this fight or flight mode. Um, some people kind of turn into like a chicken with their head cut off, running around trying to do things to, again, get them out of that anxious, anxious feeling. But then, you know, what they're doing could be riddled with mistakes, um, which are then going to cost you even more time in the long run. And some people uh, respond to this anxious feeling um, of overwhelm by just kind of shutting down and turning into, you know, you you see the, the, um, the analogy of the armadillo that just curls up and shuts out the, the world or the ostrich with its head in the sand. Um, so those are the ways that people respond to overwhelm and the causes, but what's the solution? So the solution again is our thoughts. And there's a lot of 
it's kind of the good news and the bad news and the good news. The bad news is that our thoughts are causing this uh, overwhelm, but also our thoughts can be the solution to this overwhelm. So step one is you're going to figure out what you're thinking that's causing you to be overwhelmed and anxious. So for example, um, I've had clients who say that their thoughts are, you know, I, I don't know how to do this. I'm never going to get this done. I don't have enough time. This is going to take so much work. Um, and when you think you don't have enough time, you kind of start to freak out. You feel anxious. You shut down. You avoid or you create a situation and, and then you end up creating a situation where you don't have time because you've spent all this time freaking out and shutting down. So um, when you are in a state of anxiety, you are not thinking clearly and you are not doing the right math. Your brain, you cannot trust your brain when you're in this state of anxiety. So like I said, if, you, if you're having trouble getting out of that anxious uh, feeling and tapping into your uh, logical brain, do the the exercise that I, I explained before of doing the body scan and describing the physical sensations to distract your brain. If you're beyond that point, um, that's where you do the thought work. And so you've, you identify the thought that you're having that's causing this, this feeling, and then you figure out a new thought that you can believe that would be better. So um, example thoughts are, it always gets done because it has to, um, or I have the time I need to get this done. I know that when I calm down, I will see that I have enough time. Um, and these are, you know, again, believable thoughts that can help you just incrementally bring down that anxiety level, bring down the overwhelm. We have Moira Rose here saying, worry is but an undernourished enthusiasm. Okay, and then there are a couple tricks that I wanna tell you about here. The inclination is to come up with a new thought that is the converse of the original thought, but sometimes you are not ready to believe that thought. So instead, you're going to come up with uh, a different thought that feels better, even if it doesn't speak to the initial thought. So if the initial thought is, I don't have enough time, the converse thought would be, I have enough time, but perhaps that's not something you can believe. But maybe the believable thought is, I know how to make a plan for what I want to do. I've Or another alternative believable thought would be, I've always gotten my work done before. So these are not necessarily related to the thought, I don't have enough time, but they're believable thoughts. So it doesn't have to be directly related to that initial thought. It doesn't need to be the converse of that thought. Um, the second trick in, um, in doing this work is it's very hard for the brain to make a plan and execute on a plan at the same time. It's much easier to make a plan and then execute the plan later. So, um, this is why you, any writing teacher you've had has always told you to make an outline before you start writing. Um, this way you're telling your brain that all you have to do is make a plan. You don't have to actually do the work. You just have to make a, make a plan. And that um, is much more calming to the brain. It's much less overwhelming. Um, and then once you've made that plan, all you have to do is follow it. So um, this is a really good solution for overwhelm, um, especially for uh, a situation where you have a, a big project, perhaps you're writing a brief, you know, you need to outline the brief first rather than just diving in and writing and feeling overwhelmed because you don't know where it's going um, and you're overwhelmed by everything that you need to put into the brief. Um, you just need to tell yourself, I just need to come up with a plan on how to approach this, um, this project or this to-do list. And then, um, the same way that that you don't that your external things do not cause your your feelings, it's the thought that causes your feelings. You do not have simply because you have a lot to do does not mean that you have to feel overwhelmed. You can recognize that you have a lot to do and not feel overwhelmed because you're thinking thoughts that do not lead to overwhelm. Okay, so moving on to setting priorities. Um, 
Um, so I, I like this little um, cartoon. If you can't see it, it says, if we're going to prior prioritize, we're going to need some prior priorities. Um, so we can't do it all. The amount of things we believe we should do and do well is disproportionate to the amount of time we have. And a lot of us let life tell us what the priorities are. We're not thinking for ourselves what our priorities should be. We're letting, you know, social norms tell us how we should prioritize. So when we really start to dig into what it is we want and how we truly want to spend our time and what we want what we want to prioritize, it can lead to a lot of guilt and shame because perhaps what we really want to do is different than what we have been taught we should do. Um, and this this is a kind of cognitive dissonance that, that grows out of really digging into what you want and how you want to prioritize. Um, and this is especially uh, common for women, this guilt and shame that comes in, comes from identifying your true priorities when they conflict with um, social norms. And that's because uh, women are taught that it's our number one job to help and serve and take care of other people. So when we have a priority that is not in line with that gender norm, um, it results in some guilt. Uh, and, you know, it can be both ways. You have guilt at guilt at home because at home because you're not working or you haven't spent enough time working um or you can have guilt in the workplace because you feel like you're neglecting your home life um when you are not setting priorities i.e being honest with yourself and others about what you want you don't know you just don't know what you want you don't know what you want to do you don't know what you should do um because you have no priorities uh, you have no idea when to say yes to others and when to say no, and really when to say yes or no to yourself. Uh, so you end up taking on more than you can get done and you feel out of control and as if nothing is ever, uh, nothing is ever getting done because you've failed to prioritize. So obviously prioritization is very important to time management. Now, I obviously can't tell you how to prioritize. Everyone's life is different and everyone's desires for how they want to live are different. And when I'm talking about priorities, I'm not just talking about priorities in the workplace. I'm talking about priorities um, throughout your life. So, you know, priorities at home, priorities in, at work, um, priorities with family, all of that. Um, you can't really think of work priorities in a vacuum because time time management is a, as a, an act of distributing your time both inside and outside of the office. Um, so an exercise that I generally recommend in identifying your priorities is to write down your top five priorities. And then from there, write down everything you did yesterday or you could write down everything you did last weekend um, or even last week. And you can look at how, how you're spending your time matches up with your priorities. So um, by doing this, it's a little bit uncomfortable because you're going to see that you may not be living according to your values or what you, what you prioritize in your life or what you want to prioritize in your life. Um, but it's a really effective exercise and kind of gives you a little bit more consciousness in your day-to-day -day life of how you're spending your time. Okay, now I'm going to get into some tips here. And um, like I said, I there is no perfect organizational system, but there are some tips that I like to uh, give people in terms of, of their approach to time management. Um, and I do want to let everybody know that um, everyone who's attending this webinar will um, have the opportunity to get access to a training that I do where I teach my exact time management system, everything I do to get everything on my plate done. And it's a very, very detailed system. Now, I'm not saying it's the perfect system. As I said, there's not a perfect system. You have to have the right mindset to execute on any time management system. But um, anyone who is attending this webinar 
and who registers on my website um, before the end of March will get access to this training for free. It's usually only available to people who are in my paid membership, this debt collective, but I want to make it available to all of you because I'm sure you came here expecting very detailed explanation of how to manage your time. And I've focused primarily on mindset, again, because mindset is the key to executing on your organizational system and your calendaring, however you calendar your time. Okay, so here's a few tips for you. This is one, one thing that I like to do. I plan out my whole week. I know that's not necessarily realistic for everyone, especially for those who are, you know, more junior attorneys who have supervisors who may be, you know, giving you unexpected assignments, unexpectedly calling you into their office for meetings. Um, so I like to plan my whole week, but you can also plan on a day, day by day basis if you feel like that functions better for you. Um, I like to do it on Saturday or Sunday morning. And although I, excuse me, just a second. I do try to not work on the weekend, but for me, doing this planning on the weekend is worth it because it kind of helps you avoid those Sunday night blues where you start start to feel that impending doom of the week to come because you because you've now laid out exactly what you're going to do for the week or at least for your Monday. So you can, you know, have a restful night, a peaceful night and enjoy your Sunday. Um, another tip is to schedule your personal rest your personal time, your free time, your rest time, whatever is um, your time outside of the office, always schedule that first. And the reason is that you are going to always want to do what your primitive brain is telling you to do versus what your prefrontal cortex, your rational brain knows you want to do for your long-term benefit. So, you know, even on the weekends, I put into my calendar how it, what I wanna do on the weekends. If I wanna sit and watch Netflix all day, I put that in my calendar. Um, because I, it's very easy to have these grand plans for the weekend or for your evening. And then, you know, you're, you, the lure of Netflix comes in and you find that you've spent your whole weekend watching TV or doing things that you had not intended to do. And you feel, and, and then you kind of double down on how you're feeling. You beat yourself up for having done, um, not done what you had planned to do. And so the time that you were supposed to relax, be relaxing ends up not being relaxing because you're uh, making yourself feel guilty for not having followed through with your with what you'd like to do. So I always say put, put your personal time on the calendar. Um, we're running a little late on time here. Um, so I'm going to try to go through the rest of these quickly with not so much explanation. Um, planning on um, plan on not wanting to do and do what you schedule yourself to do. You have to plan for resistance. Like I said, your primitive brain is always going to want to do the easier thing. Um, and so that's just part of the deal. You have to plan to not want to do it and do it anyway. Be realistic about how much time things take, but definitely set a, an amount of time that you're going to spend on a project. Um, because if you just sit down to write a brief, but you don't give yourself a time limit, you'll find ways to take hours and maybe days days or weeks longer than you needed for that brief because you've approached it with an unmanaged mind. Um, another one, another tip is get comfortable with B minus work. And a lot of lawyers um, take objection, object to this because, you know, they're like, I can't turn in B minus work. I That's malpractice. Um, but B minus work, it's not necessary. Your B minus work is not is probably A work, A plus work for a lot of people. And the reason I, I think you need to get comfortable with B minus work is because as perfectionists, as many lawyers are, um, we're always going to want to do more. You're always, you will never view the task as complete. Um, so if you if you want to, you can schedule time later. But I strongly recommend that you finish the task in the amount of time you've allotted for it and and learn to tr get comfortable with being satisfied with the quality of that work. Um, again, this is something there's 
this is something that lawyers are very uncomfortable with. And so I would encourage you to reach out to me if you want to dig into it a little bit deeper. Um, another tip is schedule over overflow time for the unexpected. As, as lawyers, we know that we're always getting unexpected um, assignments, unexpected calls from clients, unexpected emergencies. Um, Leave, leave buffer time in your schedule for overflow and unexpected events. Um, it's also important to schedule focus time because, um, because it's very easy to sit down to write something that requires focus and then get distracted by a million other things. And I'll talk a little bit about how to, how to set, set up your environment for uh, focus. Um, Also, it's important that if you're a, an attorney that uses a billable hour to include bill, billing time in the allotted time for your project. So um, a lot of attorneys make the mistake of not allotting billing time, and then you find yourself at the end of the day not having billed any time or, um, or at the end of the month not billing, having billed all of your time. So it's really important to include that in your schedule, scheduling time. Um, and then... In terms of focus time, um, it's very important to limit distractions when you're sitting down to do an assignment or a project that requires a lot of focus. So I know it's sometimes as an attorney not possible to turn off all of the notifications that are kind of constantly buzzing in us and, and producing that dopamine loop that we that that keeps us coming back, whether it's social media or checking your email or pulling up. The, the news, um, it's very difficult to ignore those notifications because you get that little ding and then that burst of dopamine um, and then you get the reward of having looked at whatever that distraction is and you get pulled away from the work at hand. So um, find a way to limit those distractions as much as possible, um, ideally all of them, but if you can't limit limit all of them, limit them to only those that are the most important um, people that can get through to you. So for example, your managing partner or your boss um, and then block out everyone else. Okay. The last topic I want to, the last, yeah, the last topic I wanna to touch on is this myth of the work-life balance. We hear about it all the time. I use the term a lot because it's just, the easiest way to address the topic. It's a, a term that everyone kind of knows. Um, we've been told we can have it all and that a balance between work and life is achievable, but the use of the word balance, in my opinion, is a bit of a misnomer. Um, in reality, the tension between work life and home life is more of a given type. So some days you will be giving more time to work. Other days you will be striving for more time with family, friends, or doing the things you like to do outside the office. So instead of striving for balance, I would encourage you to strive for presence. Um, when you are at work, I would strive for being calm, using the tools that we have talked about today, being calm, being focused, and being present in that work. And when you are at home, instead of thinking and worrying about work, be present with whomever and whatever you are choosing to spend your time. And, and it's really about living consciously. And the first step to living consciously is planning your time. So when you put something on your calendar and you develop the mindset necessary to follow through on that item, you are telling your brain you are where you're supposed to be. You are where you plan to be. And when you can tell your brain that, it leads to a sense of calm. It leads to a sense of self-satisfaction, self-trust. And most importantly, it allows you to be present in that moment. So rather than looking for work-life balance, try to find presence. And the last thing I want to leave you with is that all of this takes a lot of work. You know, I make it sound easy. Just replace your thought, replace the old thought with a new thought. This takes practice day after day, um, reminding yourself of the new thought. And, and as time goes on, you're going to do 
do that more easily. I know we're running a couple minutes over here. I hope you'll hang on just for a second. Um, I want to just point out a few uh, opportunities here. I offer free mini coaching sessions on my website. So we didn't have enough time for a Q&A today. So if anyone would like to dive into any of these topics a little more deeply, please go to my website, thestetcollective.com. And um, and we can do a free mini coaching session. You can learn more about how coaching works and um, and about my coaching program where I teach you the skills um, that I use to coach myself so that you can then go on to coach yourself in the future on any topic that comes up in your life. Um, again, if you subscribe to my website by the 31st of March, you will receive um, access to a free time management training that's going to be released in the next month where I teach every teach in detail my time management, uh, my time, my approach to time management. And lastly, anyone from this webinar who signs up for my coaching program by April 30th uh, will be eligible for a 20% discount on the total cost of that package as a thank you to um, you for your participation. We received a lot of interest with the first part of the seminar and I expect to receive a lot of interest. So we wanna thank you for that interest with a 20% discount. And again, I apologize for going a little bit over here and uh, not being able to do the Q&A, but please reach out to me at thestetcollective.com and I'd be happy to chat more with you on anything that's been discussed today. Thanks so much. And I would just like to thank you, Alyssa, for joining us today and giving that wonderful, uh, much needed presentation. Uh, this does conclude our webinar. Please make sure to return to your My Learning dashboard and complete the course evaluation. Thank you for choosing New York State Bar Association programs and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Ernesto. Thanks, Alyssa. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you, everyone.